intended as a mechanism for to make it easier to send and receive data. Although the primary thought is for emergency operations, it's got all sorts of uses for public service stuff. Um, one of the events we're looking at um, for next year is going to be something that the city is going to sponsor with a large number of participants um, where, where we're going to, they, they need a way, a reliable way to send back data, you know, who's reached a certain point, and they're going to be someplace where there's no real internet connection. So that would be one of the, I don't know if the city's going to do it, but one of the things they've asked is, can you do it? And there's the one, is it your club or your old club that used to, that does it? There's one down down in Maryland where they, it's, it's a marathon and it's across six chains of mountains or chains of hills, so they're sending the data. Um, they happen to be using, I, I know they were using D-Star at one point, but they're also using some other. Uh, yeah, so you've all seen digital. Uh, I mean, we don't. I don't know that we'll, uh, you know, that we'll go through digital per se. We can do something. We can do something real quick. With a digital transmission, your your computer is actually feeding the microphone of your radio. It's feeding with tones. The tones are received on the other end, translated back into the characters. There are all sorts of different modes that you can use. Some of them have all sorts of error correction built in. What's called forward error correction, which means that. It's not only sending the data, but it's sending enough additional data that if the data isn't received properly, most of the time the other end can figure out what was sent, what the error is. And it's all sorts of interesting mathematics that I'm sure Fred could tell us about for a couple of hours, uh, but we're not going to let him. And uh, uh, forward error correction is very interesting. They've also got the ability to do what's called automatic repeat requests resend request, which is what, what packet, packet does. You know, if a, you send it in a, in a group of 1,500 characters or 1,000 characters. When they get there, you have a checksum. If the checksums don't match, a repeat request. So you can do all sorts of highly accurate data transmissions. I'll just do a little something just to show you. Um, I'm going to put this in transmit. This is one called MT63. This is one of the more accurate modes. It's also very good. This mode, you can actually hear. Oops. This mode, you can be in a situation where you can't hear it on your radio, and you can't see it on this. This area is called the waterfall down here, where you're seeing the yellow. And you can't see it, yet. The, the computer will detect that it's there, and it will receive it accurately. So it's below the noise level. If you can have, I've seen these things where, where there's people talking over the transmission, there's PSK going on, there's CW going on, and this thing just goes right along and, and works. So it's pretty, pretty damn accurate. Um, on this particular thing, this is called the waterfall. You see the, the signals going by. This is where you type in your stuff, and this is where you see what's being sent. So I sent test, 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 hello world. Now you're seeing characters going along the screen here. That's because in this room, in this building, there's so much RF around that it's, it's picking up, you know, it's picking up just random, random garbage because it's, it's RF. But notice that what I sent came through accurately. Um, by the way, for those of you who are wondering what the hell I'm doing here, um, I've got this radio going into a dummy load, and I've got this radio going into a dummy load. Okay, so, and the dummy load, and both radios are, this radio is set for about five watts. So even with dummy loads at five watts, there's enough signal going out that this radio here can be picked up by that radio there. And remember that a dummy load doesn't mean that there's no transmission. A dummy load just means it isn't a very good antenna, so hopefully it's not going to send out too much. But it's still, 
an antenna, and it will still radiate. And there are all sorts of stories around of people who've made you know, distance contacts around the world and they're operating into a dummy load. So just always be careful. All right. The, the main thing about NBEMS is that it lets you set um, various types of messages and then we'll send those messages with checksums so you can be sure that the message got through. Here's a common one. Some of you may recognize this. It's the standard ARRL uh, message gram. Radio gram, sorry, radio gram. So uh, this is my number 56. I don't know if anybody even remembers what these codes mean. Well, see, this one has a built-in cheat sheet. So here's the list of, of the messages. Fantastic. You can select your message and you'll just say, there you go. Um, time filed, I can just tell it to select the current time to... Uh, And then the other thing that's always a pain in the rear is counting the check. If those of you who've ever done a radiogram and what gets included in the check and what doesn't, this thing does it for you automatically. Then when you've got it, you can just send it. Now watch, I'm going to be sending on this screen. It'll show up on that screen. If I've done it. Oh, first it wants me to save the file. This is the MT63. That little beep, 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 beep that you heard before, right at the beginning, is called an RSID. It's sending, it's telling the other station what, how it's sending, so the other station can automatically adjust, and will automatically find the right frequency. Is, is that only for NBF EMS, or is that for most digital? That's for most digital. Now this takes a fair amount of time. You see how long it was transmitting? It's finally just actually starting. To, to decode on there because of all the error checking it's doing. So it's, when it finally gets enough data, it's saying, okay, now I can start translating. Where Bruce. are you sending it to? Where are you sending it to? Another radio? Or yeah, right here, this radio. I'm sending from that radio to this radio. Oh, okay. And this is all header information. Uh, it's slow. One of the, the one thing about these things is that they're slow. The, they're nowhere near the speed of something like Pactor but Pactor is $1,500 to $5,000 for the modem. So, for... So what if two people are sending in the same frequency at the same time? Then, then it'll be like anybody else, any other situation where two people are talking at the same time. So you'll get into... into right. Okay. Right. Yes? How, how wide is the signal? This particular signal is 500, uh, 500 hertz wide. Some of these modes go up to 2,000 hertz wide. Some of them are, are, are only 500. So now what happened is when it finished sending, it actually brought up the form on this, on this station. You know, that could be, that station there could be at a, um, at a shelter. This could be the EOC. And this is, this is, well, we didn't use the radiogram, but this is what we were testing over the summer. Um, so it brought up the form. This is what I typed in. It actually brings it up as a form. And then I can even, whoops, wrong computer. Sorry, you can save that and print it out. Uh, it automatically saves. I have it set to automatically save. But I can also, I can tell it to, um, to view a delivery copy. So this is, this is now something I can print out and hand to someone. What we were doing over the summer, we were sending, we were actually sending um, using the ICS two, uh, yeah, the 213 form 
from Stanford Shelter to here, and then uh, and then I would bring him. I was over there in the uh, the other side of the hall where the 911 room is, and I'd bring him into here, and that was where the timing was perfect. I just gotten a status report from Stanford High. I'm walking in here, and Ted Jankowski, the director of public safety, is saying, "Okay, does anybody have a status report from Stanford Shelter? Here you go. It's." all formatted, printed, you know, timing is everything. He's looking at me like, what is this? It's a status report. Where'd you get it? Well, it's, you know. <laughs> so, um, and that's, they've got all sorts of forms in here. One of the things I, uh, they've got all the ICS forms, which is what we were using. Oops, so, for example. John, what, is that a software package? Is that just FL Digi has all the forms? Or? This is this is a an add-on to FL Digi, and it costs twice as much as FL Digi itself, which is a joke because <laughs> FL Digi, Digi, FL Digi is free, so this costs twice as much. Um, it's it's part of this one they call FL Message, but the the whole NBEMS suite is FL Digi and FL Message and FL Wrap. What is FL Digi? FL Digi is software for doing various digital communications modes. PSK, you've heard, most of you have heard of PSK 31, uh, Olivia, Domino, uh, um, MT63, MFSK, there's a whole bunch of different modes. They each have their advantages and disadvantages. You see a lot of PSK going on, for example, 14070 at 7035, uh, 3581, um, all those, I'll play one for you in a second so you can hear it. It's a, um, it's a sound that once you hear it, you'll, you'll never forget. It's the only one that sounds cool. It sounds like something from the outer limits, you know, or, or from the twilight zone. But um, there are all these different, all of these different modes. So FL Digi, if you've heard of uh, Ham Radio um, HRD, Ham Radio Deluxe is another one. Mix W, there's uh, Win PSK. Well, somebody in this local area built one of them. Win PSK, didn't W1SQL build something? Yeah, he had, yeah, he had a program, sort of obsolete. Yeah. yeah, it is. I mean, th there are whole bunches of programs. One of the things you can do with these is RTTY. I don't know why you'd want to do RTTY, but. <laughs> is there, do, you yes. need, do you need Digi to run message? Yes. Okay. Yes, you need FL Digi to run, to run message. So. FL Digi, a lot of people just use if they're going to do digital. When we were doing digital for field day, we were using FL Digi. You add NBEMS, or you add F FL Message, now you have NBEMS, and you're able, to do, you're able to do this. We can send spreadsheets. So that was another thing we did for the test for field day. We took a, Frank dummied up a spreadsheet that was his logistics requirements for the next 24 hours for the, for the Stanford Shelter, sent it over here, you know, bring it back into the guys responsible for, uh, for logistics. You know, we're going to need, we're going to need another 500 meals. That was the, the you know, we're going to need 500 meals, we need 100 this, we need 200 that, we need more bedding, blah, blah, blah. All a nice spreadsheet that, in fact, uh, Red Cross can just put into their automated system, and away you go. I think Georgie was first, but. Is that data that you can send? Say again? I can send any data file. Okay. I, I, send, I can certainly send any text data file. Uh, NBEMS is not great when it comes to binary data. It's going to convert it to base 64 stuff. It, you know, it takes forever to send. But it's, it's, it's great on anything text, CSV files, uh, those kinds of things. Anything human readable. Can... Anything human readable, yeah. It can send the others, it just it's slow with them. If you've got, if you're going to be using this, yes. If you're going to be using this. So, for example, a lot of us have generators. Stanford High, which is the shelter, one of the shelters, 
has a generator. All of the, the three shelters all have generators. There's a generator in this building. We also have a big mother battery over on the other side that uh, Frank keeps charging up, um, which uh, it's got the, what's the rig, not rig blaster, not rig ru runner, the one, you know, the one where you can put in the generator and the, and the battery. Power, the, power gate. Huh? Power gate, yeah. And the power gate, if the battery starts wearing down, the power gate sounds an alarm. And every time, every Thursday night or so, when they clean in there in the in 911 area, somebody disconnects the power supply. And about four days later, the alarm starts going <laughs> off. And I get a call at 2 o'clock in the morning from Captain Lombardo, come down here and fix this damn battery. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, what frequency were you transmitting? Or, or I, I'm, using, using? I'm using 24919 just because I figure that uh, at, at this point, tw nobody's going to be at 12 meters this time of night. Well, this could be done on two meters for this. You. This can be done on two meters with FM. It can be done on two meters with sideband. It can be done on anywhere in the ham bands. John. So that, the, the back point and the battery point as well, where I've seen this used before, is actually with HDs, um, where you key up the radio and you click send, and you wait until the computer says it's done sending, and you unkey the radio. And it just it's just audio going in and out of the radio, so you can use two HDs to do it. Not really efficient, but it, it works just as well as everything else. So it's uh, it, it, it really you, you can do it on 1.2 gig. You can do anything with it. For Sandy, we had uh, actually we had this this guy and this guy were up here with me. They were set up over in Tom Lombardo's <laughs> area, uh, and we had uh, a computer and and uh, we were figuring we we're just going to be using VHF. So we had a, a whatever it is that that. Um, Chris has and a computer over there for for VHF. Uh, but the one of the nice things about NBEMS is it works VHF, HF, whatever you want. It works the same way on all of them. When you've got a multi-mode radio like this, will be you know VHF, UHF, HF. You don't even have to change the radio. The only thing you have to do is change the antenna. Right? It's all the same. There's no difference to it. John, did you have another? Well, uh, yeah. Okay. This is a. Is this a uh, this is asynchronous. There's no, uh, there's no reply from the receiving station, correct? There is. There's a piece of it called uh, FLARQ, F-L-A-R-Q. A-R-Q is automatic resend request, which is what packet does. The internet, for example. When the internet sends packets, every packet has a checksum in it. Checksum is, is a mathematical construct that with a very, very high percentage of, of certainty, not, nothing can be perfect, but a very high percentage of certainty, the checksum will tell you if something w didn't get there, if if the data was corrupted. And in, in the internet, you're sending packets of 4K, 2K, it depends on what they've got set up. Every 2K or every 4K of data, the checksum is computed. If the checksum doesn't work out correctly, it the receiving station asks for a resend. That's the way the internet works. This also has that. I didn't want to show it tonight because I screwed something up and it wasn't working. Um, but this has that capability. Now that's going to slow things down. You know, it's, when you're going across a, uh, a cable internet modem, you know, when you're at whatever it is, five gig or five meg or whatever, it doesn't matter. When you're sending like this, it can slow it down quite a bit. But it is there for you. So if you're in really bad situation, you can use Fork and actually do that. Uh, well, while I'm doing, you can't see it because I have no way to force an error, but there's a checksum at the end of the message on these things. So if the, if the checksum fails, you get, a, you get a message. If you're on HF and rotten conditions and something misses, you will get an error message saying there's a checksum error. Then you look at your message, you decide whether you want to resend it or not. For example, if it's a whole bunch of numerical data, you have no way of knowing. You know, whether it's right or wrong, you'll ask for a resend. If it's text and you can read the text and it looks okay, then, you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, but. Do you pull the audio cable for a second? Huh? Do you pull the audio cable for a second to close an error? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's true, it could. Um, no, it's not. Uh, but uh, at any rate, the, this gives you the ability to send spreadsheets, it gives you the ability to send text, it gives you the ability to send formatted reports. Uh, and, and especially with the ICS forms, it, it gives you the ability to send exactly what it is 
that that people want. When I say people, I mean like the uh, the folks in emergency management. That that's an ICS two hundred three, which is a basic uh, who who is the who are the people in charge? All the planning stuff. Who handles all the planning stuff? It's basically that on the wall. It's basically that on the wall. Yes, it is that on the wall. Okay, and that's that's the that's one of the critical documents in in uh, in ICS in the integrated command system is who's in charge, who's reporting to who, who's working together, what are people doing? Well, that form is built in here. You can just fill it out and send it. This is the ICS 205. Many of you saw it because I sent one out before the, uh, before the storm. Now, I just sent it as an email, um, but you may remember as it was a PDF. But, but this is a standard form, which is these are all the frequencies that we're going to be using. So if somebody says, if, if somebody says okay, go to Channel 3, you know what Channel 3 is. If somebody says, go to the Region 1 interface channel, that should be on the on your form. So be, during an incident, you always prepare an ICS-205 so everybody knows what frequencies they're going to use. What a concept. For amateur radio, do you have a, you, are you using a standard listing? When you say a standard listing, uh, In other words, uh, you already have this pre -pre prepared that it's the same list every time you go. It's usually, for us, it's usually the same list. This, I made some changes to it. I, mean, but I besides, added, yeah. But it's adjustments. But it's I mean, yeah, it's, it's pretty much the same list every year because we don't change uh, very much. If in, in, a, in an incident, like if there's suddenly a forest fire and you're throwing 1,000 people into northern Idaho, obviously that's going to be all new, all new numbers. For Stanford, I've got a standard ICS uh, 205, and some of you, at least I know, I sent it to because you were you would volunteer to participate. John, I'll set you up here. You're saying ICS 205, FLAR, MBMS, all there's a lot of confusing stuff that could be something to be perceived as confusing and, and complicated, and it makes it sound somewhat difficult to do. Could you sort of break this down on a high level on, on how this is done and what you need to do this? And Simple blocks. Need hmm? Simple blocks. It's, if I can do it, okay. In all seriousness, um, let's see, where to start? Some of you started with FL Digi a couple of, uh, what, two years ago, remember, we had a, a, um, uh, a boot camp. Uh, others of you have picked it up. Getting into digital is fairly simple. There's a lot of information on the net. We can do another boot camp if people are interested. Um, the hard part of FL Digi is, is getting connected up the first time. It's not that hard if you just follow the instructions. Um, once you're connected up, you go out and you practice a little. You get on the air and you practice. You send some messages, you receive some messages. You send some messages. You, know, you, send, you have a QSO. There are people who have QSOs. You get on to the to the areas where the where these things are taking place. You'll find people. You'll talk to them. It's just like any other QSOs, you know, in CW and in, in sideband and AM, FM. It doesn't matter. This is just another way of doing it, except you're typing your message. Um, once you get a little bit proficient with that, then you can start practicing sending files. And it's very simple to send a file. So, just out of FL Digi, for example. If I look at FL Digi here, I can say I can say I can insert a file. So instead of having to type out, you know, something, I can I can insert a file. For example, uh, there's a guy um, actually he's in Westchester. I can't remember his call sign off him. Who set, who retransmits the the space data, you know, the space propagation data, and all he does is he copies the file down from the internet. Inserts it in here and send, Soup, off it goes. Uh, then as you become more practiced, you try the FL message stuff. It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple to do. I mean, literally all you do is, with FL message, is you, you start it up, you pick your form. Oops. Um, You pick, you pick your form, I don't know what that form is, and you fill it out, and then hit autosave. And that's all that happens. And what's going to come in on the other end 
if they've all if they're also running the same software. Um, what's going to come out of the other end is a properly formatted message, like that. Yes. <coughs> so basically, at your house, what you need is a computer, a modem, and the software. Right. And the radio and an antenna. Yeah. Uh, now, if you have, um, say, you have a technician license, uh, and you want to transmit that or on an HF frequency, it, you can't. It's do still that. the same. Same rules. The rules don't change okay. as far as that goes. The, um, let's see, technicians, where are technicians allowed? Where are they ten allowed meters. to be? Uh, where on 10 meters, though? Uh, oh, so mo <coughs> most of the digital traffic on 10 meters is at 28.120. Yes, yes. So, in fact, the technicians could get on there to send. Okay. And they, I believe they do have CW only. Eighty, forty, and fifteen. It's the old Which novice, is? the old novice bands. Yeah. But I think that's CW only. I don't think you're allowed to send data. Yeah. But, but you can send this stuff. You can do this stuff on on VHF and UHF. So if you go into the, for example, if you go into the sideband areas of of six meters and two meters, a lot of the people who are doing, you know, trying the the real distance stuff with with uh, sideband on six meters and two meters. They're doing it with digital modes because digital modes, like CW, are a lot more efficient than voice. Efficient in terms of you get further distance for a given amount of power. But so. with those with the proper licensing, can can use HF with this and, and, right. and they general and they, class. They are, they're out there also. Yeah, general class, uh, lots lots of it. All right, as a technician, can I go on the two meter repeater? Uploaded to the repeater and it goes to whatever, which will now take it out on HF. I don't know. I'm transmitting on my band. On I, my, I don't know. I don't know. If, I, I know. I don't know. Because that you don't use the repeater for digital modes. Yeah. <laughs> right. I should point out that there are on each of those bands there is a preferred yes. digital. In each file. band, in each band, 160 down through 10, there's a preferred area for digital. But in terms of whether people using repeaters can do cross-band into HF territory, I don't know. I know I've seen that discussion in QST every now and then. I know they can do it on voice. Then they probably can do it on... So that's why I'm asking. Yeah, then they probably can. So, just to clarify one thing, this is point-to-point, -point or station-to-station, -station, right? Uh, with no store forward. That's correct. NBEMS is point-to-point, -point. there's no store and forward. Capability on it. You can't, you, you can't have an automated station sitting there that just operates, collecting messages and then forwards them to somebody. You want to have, you, you, you're going to have point to point. We're going to talk about WinLink uh, briefly. We've talked about it before, where you can do store and forward. But, John, is that a limit? Is that a that's not a legal limitation, that's a limitation of software. That's a limitation of so software. So if you were automatically saving these files to a folder and then watching that folder and generating emails and files based on those folders, you could do it. Yes. Files. Yes. Okay. Now we, we did, sorry, I guess, as I said, over the summer when the state was having its exercise, we were set up to use NBEMS. We were using it from Stanford Shelter to here, from here to uh, Bridgeport to the Bridgeport EOC, and from the Bridgeport EOC over to the Red Cross, um, uh, to the Red Cross Regional Operations Center. They call it something else, but it's the Regional Operations Center in Bridgeport. We can't hit the Red Cross Regional Operations Center in Bridgeport from here because there's some there's a hill called Fairfield in the way. Um, we have been working with NVIS antennas, uh, near vertical incident Skyway, which we can talk about later. We've been experimenting with that, and that works very nicely to talk to the Bridgeport Regional Operations Center. And from Bridgeport Regional Operations Center, we've been experimenting with NVIS up to Red Cross and Farmington. And that's also working very nicely. Huh? What uh, band? Mostly we've been using 80, 80 and 40. Uh, NVIS in this area during the day, typically 40 meters at night, typically 80 meters. 
you can't go higher because it won't work in BIS. Over the past week or two, things have been strange in the atmosphere, <laughs> and and the minimum, the maximum usable frequency has been about one megahertz. You can't mm -hmm. even do 160 <laughs> at night. <laughs> it's really been weird. So uh, we'll, we'll talk. We can talk about NBIS another time. But it's the stuff where you you beam the, the signal straight up, and it comes back down in about 100, 200 mile radius. Um, so we, we we were set up, and we had we we were arranged. Um, for Sandy to do exactly what we'd done in practice over the summer, where we had um, we had uh, uh, AT at the Red Cross in Darien, he had an NVIS antenna. So if we needed it, we would have sent him VHF from here because setting up an NV, uh, an HF antenna on this building is you know, kind of iffy. Um, uh, we we sent um, we would have sent it over to Tony to uh, AT. AT would have sent it to Bridgeport. And then the guys from, from the Bridgeport Club would have sent it up to uh, Farmington. So we had regional, we had statewide communication, at least from this area, for Red Cross, digital communication. Okay, so now that we know that we really have more capabilities with HF frequencies, when are we running our next general course? Well, we are trying an experiment, um, Steve and Andrew are going to try this idea of the structured, um, the structured cell study course. Explain it, please. We came up with an idea, I think it was the last meeting, wasn't last it? Meeting. Of a structured course for people who really don't want to go traveling, you know, eight weeks going up to Bridgeport or to Valhalla, using the material that's out there, but structured with a, um, Kind of a guidance, you know. Okay, I want you to do this chapter next, and then when you're finished, whoever the instructor is, I, the instructor, I'm here to help you. You know, ask questions, go through it. We're not going to do a formal classroom teaching, but what we'll be doing is guidance, somebody to answer questions, somebody to help through the problem areas. Mentoring or elmering. Yeah, you know, mentoring or what used to be called elmering. And honestly, the idea came out of what happened with Alan, where he was. Uh, he was confused by a lot of the material. It took about two hours. Uh, I think we were at, at, at Barnes and Noble in the mall. Two hours, and he, you know, got through some of the basic things that he was confused about. And then all of a sudden, it was, you know, next thing. Oh, I'm taking the test tomorrow. Oh, I passed. You know? <laughs> so, and that's there's certainly enough material that a lot of people can do it on their own. If you feel that you need a class, then. There are other clubs that do classes, and maybe we'll have a class of our own. I'm just finishing a, a general general study class right now. And what we, we're trying to do something different, which is for those people who want to do, you know, structured self-study, who don't want to drive to Bridgeport or don't want to drive to, to Valhalla. Certainly, if you want to drive to Valhalla, and hopefully you all saw the message that went out today that WEC is doing a, an extra class, by all means. The other Eight. Eight. Yeah. Well, I'll do a plug. I'm signed up, so if someone else wants to go and needs a ride, I'm happy to. Uh... And that will be followed by a general course in March. Okay. There you go. Next to us, higher than general, right? Yeah. 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 Well, I say general, cheap. I say yeah. 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 If if this if the structured self study works, we'll, we'll we'll try that for a technician also, the technician class also. You know, a lot of people study on their own. When we had the VE session, what, about two weeks ago, most of the people, the people who came in had all, had all studied on their own. Some of them passed. Well, except yeah. one passed. Right. And, and he, he had, for the extra. and he had, no, 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 there was one guy who, who came in, he started studying on Thursday, oh, the exam yeah. was on Saturday, right. guess what, he didn't he didn't go the um, uh, There was one guy who, who took the general twice, he missed it by just a little bit, so, He's going to be the, the third, uh, the third of the three musketeers for the, for the experiment. Um, you know, we'll see. It, it's just to try something different. Everybody gives classes. It's all the same thing. What happens? The experience that a lot of clubs have is people.